Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome K.B. Jones as this year's George Morris Woodruff, this terms, George Morris Woodruff, Class of 1857 Memorial Lecturer. The Woodruff series was established in 2010 by Mr. Woodruff's great-grandson, the late H. Allen Brooks, who has a master, had a Master of Arts in the History of Art from Yale, 1955. Mr. Brooks was an eminent historian specializing in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier. For most of his long and productive career, Alan Brooks taught at the University of Toronto. His book, The Prairie School, Frank Lloyd Wright and His Contemporaries, received the Society of Architectural Historians Alice Davis Hitchcock Award as the best in the field for its year. That year was 1972, and the book has been in print ever since. After more books on Wright, Brooks turned his attention to Le Corbusier, initially editing the monumental 32 volumes of his archive. In case you don't know, Le Corbusier wrote, kept every piece of paper he ever wrote anything on, <laughs> and, and unlike me, including what, he, what his, he was told to buy at the supermarket. Um, um, I, 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 and this was edited on behalf of the Fondation Le Corbusier. And then in 1997, Brooks went on to publish the book, Le Corbusier's Formative Years. The inaugural Woodruff Lecture was delivered in spring 2012 by Eve Blau. Kurt Forster and Barry Bergdahl have also been Woodruff lecturers. Tonight's lecturer, K.B. Jones, holds the Bachelor of Arts from St. Olaf's College and the Master of Architecture from Yale, where she was recognized with the Wendy Elizabeth Blanning Award given to a second year student in the school who has shown the most promise of development in the profession. She has not disappointed. She is active in professional practice. She is a highly respected teacher, teacher at Ohio's State's Knowlton School of Architecture. As well, she has published extensively in architecture history, principally concentrating on modern and contemporary architecture in Italy, especially the work of Franco Albini and Franca Helg, about whom she speaks tonight. It's my pleasure to have to welcome K.B. Jones here, have her back at Yale, and please join me uh, in, in a round of applause as she delivers the lecture, Suspending Moderni Modernity, Franco Albini. K.B. Thank you very much for such a lovely and generous introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Come on down, Azalea. Come on, there's a place for you, girl. And it gives me an opportunity to welcome my wonderful Ohio State students who are here tonight. I thank you for coming tonight. You may see a few things that you're already familiar with. Um, and I'm also aware of the fact that tonight there are members of the Dean's Council who I'd like to welcome. I was tipped off by Terry Dwan, who texted me her regrets. Terry deserves a shout out because Without her pied de terre and delicious meals in Milan, this work may have never come to conclusion. I certainly want to express my gratitude to Dean Stern and uh, recognize that those seats probably that you're all sitting in are no more comfortable than when I was sitting in them 30 years ago. Um, so I'll try to stay on script. Um, but in recognizing Dean Stern, how many of you remember the PBS series Pride of Place a few years ago? So, I remember it. <laughs> I'll bet you do. It did, didn't have a long run, but it was very important for those young faculty at Ohio State who would gather every Wednesday evening to watch Bob as he shared with us a plethora of historic and contemporary ideas in the forms of buildings and their architects. Oh, that was over 30 years ago, um, but it's clear that nobody loves architecture more than Bob Stern, and probably no one has taught more of us than he has not without strong opinions, but ultimately with an open mind, a generous spirit, and a sharp wit. So I thank you for that as well as allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be able to give the George Morris Woodruff Class of 1857 um, Memorial Lecture. And now I'll turn our attention to the work of the Milanese rationalist, Franco Albini. 
I'm going to show some examples of his work with such a long and prolific career, it's difficult. I hope I give a representative sample. I'll be showing what, for me, are some of the most important products of a 47-year career. And I'm certainly not alone in having thought about, written about, considered this work. Um, one of the things that makes this work so easy is that everybody wrote about Franco Albini, Manfredo Tafuri, Bruno Zevi, Giulio Carlo Argan, Francesco Tentori, Francesco Dalco, Leonardo Benevolo, and many, many more. And all of the best journals featured Albini's work both in his lifetime and since. Domus, Rezegna, Stile, Casabella, Architectural Forum. So to do this work is quite a pleasure if one reads Italian. But to my knowledge, Albini's work has not been included in compilations by uh, modern work by uh, Ken Frampton, by Vincent Scully, which means that some of you may have missed him altogether. In 1956, Denise Scott Brown encountered Albini at the Siam Summer School in Venice, and afterwards she wrote about the key role that Albini played in continuing the modern project in Italy after the war. Albini was certainly keen to the realities of urban life and to newfound ways to be essentially modern even while dealing with the facts of post-war Italy. He embraced tradition, not unlike the spirit of T.S. Eliot or Carlos Scarpa. And in fact, it's this relationship between modernity and tradition that has um, continued to build my interest in Albini's work. Sarah Williams Goldhagen and others have considered a modern architecture um, that answers to a situated modernism. My aim today is to resituate Albini's contributions among some of the greatest modern designers and offer a portrait of this talented architect while raising some questions, questions about the relationship between influence versus novelty, interrelationships that occur in the works of some of the better known architects, and the characteristics of an, potentially an international modern zeitgeist of which he was an important part but potentially has been overlooked. Since I first began to present research about Albini in, in Montreal over a decade ago, I repeatedly found that this building, this department store in Rome, is one of his best recognized buildings. Um, maybe because it's in Rome, it maybe because it symbolizes a use of a familiar building type, the Roman palazzo, as it expresses a new modern monumentality outside the Aurelian wall, or for the exoskeletal structural system that Albini developed and exploited. But if you try to tour around Italy and look for more of these, you won't find them. Part of Albini's great legacy is that none of his buildings look alike. In addition to that, many would argue that Albini's greatest legacy is in the way he changed the, um, the way Italians exhibit art, especially historic art. And Albini was born the same year as Giuseppe Terragni. It was Terragni's work that I first went to see when I traveled through northern Italy. Um, Albini practiced for 30 years beyond Terragni. He was virtually contemporary with Carlo Scarpa and Lucan, and at least as important in his contributions to the design of contemporary museums. All I can figure out is that Albini had a lousy publicist. And so um, I'd use this modern palazzo for the cover image of my book, not only because I took the photos, so I don't have to pay for it, but also because the recognition value is important in the work of another architect, one of the current international stars, Renzo Piano. Probably you know that Renzo Piano interned with Franco Albini during the years in which the Renascente department store was designed. He was there for a three-year period after he dropped out of architecture school in Florence. Um, the first proposal for the Renascente store is this image. Um, still, we see the exoskeletal structure, but we haven't yet defined the monumental palazzo facade, and we have parking on the roof and the familiar surrounding circulation on the exterior of the building. No question about the fact that the young Renzo Piano, when he worked with um, Rogers to build the Pompidou Center in Paris, was significantly influenced by his work here. And it's worth mentioning that a uh, part of Albini's identity is as an important designer. And especially if you look for his work online today, you'll find more work in the area of furniture than architecture especially because now, uh, like this ad uh, in a recent New York Times, we see that Knoll International is fabricating these works that one can purchase. Um, furniture is accessible. Um, it's exportable. Maybe even it's desired because it's nostalgic, but it is not necessarily affordable. 
one has to believe that this is more likely for a collector than for everyday use. In fact, now Noel publishes the price as 3,700 euro. Transcends market logic. But Albini's furniture design is perhaps more important for its cult value than its market value, especially for what it teaches us about his own design process. This simple chair called Louisa is in the Museum of Modern Art collection of design. It won for Albini the coveted Compasso d'Oro Award in the 1950s. But a, 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 although apparently a very simple artifact, it took him really 18 years to perfect the model that satisfied him. And this is what's important in the design process of Franco Albini, is the iterative return constantly to resolve a problem over and over again and finding in the kernel of the problem a solution that he could exploit more and more. Albini was erudite, he was taciturn, and he typified the well-worn adage of Ernesto Rogers, who described his whole generation of architects as being capable of designing everything from the spoon to the city, dalla cucchiaio alla città. Not very modest, but in fact it was true, and in Albini's case in particular, along with his cohorts in Milan, he was responsible for a number of important urban designs, urban designs for the city of Milan and other cities when cities were expanding and they needed the sensitivity of good designers to be able to understand how to solve these complex problems. It was Albini's work in this area that brought him the uh, commission after the war and in the 1960s, along with Bob Norda and Franca Helg, for the line one of the Metropolitan in Rome, where he used this idea of Ariadne's thread to um, give meaning to the city underground. My first contact with the work of Franco Albini was in the form of this little building. It's called the Treasury of San Lorenzo. It's located in the city of Genoa. It's literally a crypt. It's underground. It's beneath the Duomo Church. And until one's eyes adjust, you'd be hard pressed to define it as a work of modern architecture. I'll return to discuss this building later because it had such an a profound influence and is yet relatively unknown. It was built in 1952, or begun in 52, finished in 56, which was a real turning point in Albini's career when he begins to work with the architect Franca Held. He had had many collaborators prior. When he teams up with Held, the studio name changes and she works with him for the next 25 years. He also at this time was working with the uh, Genoese public administrator, Caterina Mecenato. And the tiny collection of very uh, prestigious works of art that occupied these four rooms were originally part of an ecclesiastical collection that was taken over as part of the public collection of the city. Um, they claim that this green vessel housed in the first of the four circular rooms is, in fact, the Holy Grail. Now, the treasury may not be stylistically uh, characteristic of Albini's work, but really nothing is. Um, and that's the point. He was not bound to any style or dogma. And in spite of virtually defining the language of Italian rationalism during his earlier period, no two Albini buildings look alike. His work was responsive to the site, the program and yet captured its poetry from a deep understanding of each. And like the works of the best phenomenological architects, his spaces are better experienced than photographed. Subtle qualities and formal relationships of the material resolution, the design of lighting, these things all must be perceived in person. So while I try to use diagrams to reveal or clarify his ideas, I still urge you at the first opportunity to have the opportunity to experience these beautiful artifacts. I take for granted with this sophisticated audience that there's going to be a high level of knowledge of the theory of Italian rationalism. I won't spend much time identifying that, and in fact, I won't spend a lot of time on the work of Albini that's typical of this period. Um, this is one example. He did many. This is a little propaganda pavilion for the Italian National Insurance Agency. This one was in Milan, but he built them from Milan to Bari. Um, the buildings are... Uh, give good evidence, however, to where he begins as an architect. And um, Albini uh, finishes his degree at the Polytechnic in Milan in 1929. The Polytechnic at that time and for many years after was still a classical school. Um, they didn't have a modern curriculum. He um, went to work immediately for Joe Ponti. Ponti sent him to Barcelona where he saw the Barcelona Pavilion. He uh, was sent him to Paris to encounter Le Corbusier at that time period. And Shortly after he returned in 1930, um, Albini opened his own studio. And 
Ponti remained a powerful advocate of Albini throughout his career. Albini collaborated with a lot of people, and this can make it difficult to parse out what are his unique contributions, but it's something that I've made an effort to do in my research. Um, so here you get a sense of his love for this lyrical levity, materials that draw in the daylight, um, and create, create some very suggestive kinds of interiors. These are explorations that carried out throughout his career. And he had a particular love for books. You see these um, artifices for street corners, uh, temporary book pavilions, window displays, um, bookshelf studies. There were many of them. Um, and uh, quite a nice store that remained in the um, Galleria in Milan for many years. It was torn down just about a decade ago. It was the Bal Baldini and Castoldi bookstore. And this one is quite lovely. It's about a three-story interior space where the books are actually supported by the walls. And the interior suspended structure is where the shoppers have to move on a series of mezzanines and stairs, um, evocative of historic libraries and yet truly a, a modern language. At this time, when Italian modernists were exploring all kinds of uses of new materials, the Secret Glass Company produced structural glass and did everything it could to get it in the hands of architects. <clears throat> An early exhibition designed by Franco Albini with Giovanni Romano is this exhibition of Venetian glassware um, held in, on glass shelving. It would certainly be desirable to see this image in uh, color. If any of you saw the Metropolitan Scarpa glass show last year, you'd appreciate how color would resonate. But unfortunately, this is the only image we have. But at this time, a great deal of this kind of work, these exhibitions, these big installations, were taking place at the Triennale and at other exhibition centers throughout Italy. Remember that this is, um, the architects at this time were working under a fascist regime. Um, it was the 1930s. Um, there was a great desire to express national identity. This exhibition by Albini with, again, Giovanni Romano, um, was the aeronautics exhibition. It was exhibited in 1934. At the same time that Eduardo Persico and Marcello Nizzoli installed this exhibition that's called the Hall of Gold Medals. I'm sorry for such a degenerated photograph. It's all we have. But it's very important because just two years later, Romano and Albini installed this exhibition, clearly a tribute to Persico. Persico and Albini had a relationship of mutual respect. And when Persico wrote about Albini, he said that Albini was really the national face of rationalism in Italy. He gave des, um, the um, best expression to be understood, among other rationalist tendencies in Northern Europe, to define what was Italian about this version of the work. Um, this exhibition is called the Antique Goldworks Show. And it's, again, using the glass of secret so that when it was premiated by the company and recognized for um, excellent use of the materials and published in this April, 1930, April 1937 Casabella journal that I found in the Studio Albini, it was very interesting to find out that across the page um, was an image of a radio sitting up on glass legs designed by the artist Enrico Paolucci. And there was even a little. Um, Mark made at the corner of the page, showing that Albini had acknowledged that. When he then produces his glass radio, he strips it bare, uses the material in an even more abstract way, and floats the internal working of the radio above the sound-producing circle to further destabilize the look. And you can imagine what it seemed like to have a voice emerging, floating into the room from this strange object. Al um, Albini was extremely playful in his use of materials. Um, and this bookshelf is one of the best examples of that. The, um, in an era of machine aesthetic, Manfredo Tafuri called this a useless machine. Um, it had no real capacity until it was loaded with books, because all of these glass bookshelves are hanging in tension from the compression columns. The columns, these V columns, are handcrafted wood elements. And um, the project built in 1948 called Villero. Villero is the Italian name for a sailing vessel, a sail, sailboat. In 1941, when he produced this exhibition, the black and white show, or the Scipione show, as it's also known, at the Brera Museum in the Napoleonic Rooms, 
it drew significant attention. It did something else. It took the paintings off the wall and it floated them in the room. So the experience of seeing the work was not the same sequential one painting after another, but you'd see them all floating in the space and would see a number of images at the same time. It was a radically different way to see art. That little column that got reconstructed in a number of ways will appear in many, many projects by Frank Aldini and his partners. In this case, in 1954, in the Olivetti showroom in Paris, he shows that uh, the system of installing works, well lit and so on, is just as good for selling typewriters as it is for exhibiting works of art. And in Studio Albini today, one can find myriad examples of the different handcrafted elements that were made for different installations. Um, when uh, Renzo Piano was working in Rome to build the Parco della Musica, the new auditorium of Rome, and they discovered an ancient um, city, uh, the artifacts of the city get exhibited by Piano this way in that site. And in a mm, series of housing projects, Albini looks for any way possible to make um, dense housing more lyrical. Here you see these external stairways that could also be seen as an influence on piano when he renovates the port harbor in the city of Genoa. I won't spend a significant amount of time on the housing designs by Franco Albini, but it's a very important part of his early career. Throughout the 1930s, he, working with Giancarlo Palante and Renato Pen uh, Camus, received nine commissions and designed a series of housing complexes, entire neighborhood quarters throughout the city working for the fascist public housing authority. Four of these complexes are built, and this is one of them. This project is known as the Fabio Filzi Quarter. It has 449 apartments in 10 buildings, five people per apartment means he's designing basically a city for 2,000 people. It was published in Casabella as an oasis of order. But fans of neorealist cinema will recognize from Visconti's film Rocco and his brothers that this site was used to portray an inhuman environment where southern Italian migrant laborers tried to settle and tried to make homes in Milan. The existence minimum standard for housing adopted from German housing of the period was adopted uh, by the Italian authorities to try to produce the necessary efficient um, and economical housing. And uh, the Italians working in Milan were certainly uh, obliged to that system. But they tried their best to make aesthetic environments, including this interior for Fabio Filzi, uh, with drawings by Studio Albini that were exhibited at the Triennale. And another example of the change, the versatility, the flexibility in Albini's language can be observed by an, just one example of the housing he produces in the post-war period. Again, the, the standards have clearly changed. But with the important housing project, the Inacasa housing, the 14 years of producing public housing after the war, um, Albini was involved in a number of them. This one, called the Cesate neighborhood, outside of Milan, shows low-rise buildings, two-story walk-ups with a unit plan type that's quite different, changing the views and so on. So again, housing is a body of work that Albini carries out throughout his career, but you're, you're not likely to find, be able to identify the buildings by look alone. It's at this critical period, um, before the war and immediately afterward, when an important part of Albini's values about architecture is process of design gets formed. And it's largely because he's working um, in, mostly in interior design. Interiors was the position he held when he taught with <coughs> Giuseppe Samona in Venice between 1949 and 1964. And um, the quality of interiors with transparencies, with reflective surfaces, um, creating rooms within rooms, even using modest furniture, are characteristics that we can find in these early apartment building interiors that he did. This one for the Pieti family. Very, very simple, but he's always exploring ways to do things in a unique way. And the Trinale of Milan gave these architects a great outlet for explorations of ideas, for experimentation. In um, 1936, Albini's contribution to that year's Trinale was this little tiny project called Room for a Man. He plays with the dialectic of the mind and the body 
a kind of dualism where he locates all of the components related to the body in the upper part of the slide in the back of the series. All of those things um, referring to the mind come in the front, and the libreria, or the bookshelf, is the one thing that gets shifted off the rationalist grid. The glass bookshelves are also the element that gets to rise above the datum and become the tallest element. It's kind of totem within the room. But you see here the play of materials, the aesthetic nature of his explorations. Four years later, he takes another, um, has another opportunity to build a, a Milanese um, Triennale installation. This one is called Living Room for a Villa. And in this project, instead, he's creating a polemic out of the duality of inside and outside. At this time, Gio Ponte had written a very important essay trying to characterize and distinguish the modern Mediterranean residents from those modern homes of the Bauhaus north of the Alps. And his primary point was that Italians could live outside. It's a lovely climate, so we blend and blur interior and exterior spaces. And so Albini is exploring this with his aviary and birds enclosed in the space, his tree and underground uh, grass that's covered with a glass surface, and manipulating all of these things in a kind of um, exploratory and playful way. But his first opportunity to put into play um, the ideas about the modern house was this building um, for the lawyer Testerini. The building is referred to as the Villetta Testerini on the um, edge of the city of Milan. It's a freestanding house. And you can see from the site plan that he crowds the building on the corner right up to the sidewalk. So the building, in fact, the dwelling is really a wall to the landscape. And that wall has two shifted bars. And as a good rationalist, he uses geometric principles and a simple geometric palette to organize all of these spaces where one long room is the primary space of the house that then gets um, subdivided on the main level. Um, and the, the, the kind of geometric um, components are, are easy to see, quite evident. Um, this building, too, was uh, appreciated by Giuseppe Pagano, who publishes it in, um, in the same year in Casabella magazine and with a beautiful set of Hasselblad black and white photographs depicts this very iconic modern, um, modern building and even publishes the construction cost for the house in detail, prizing it for being so efficient, so economical, and so on. And like so many modern houses we see, there was color involved. And in later years when Franca Helg visited the building, she was surprised to see the use of color and, and said that she believed that it wasn't until she entered the studio that Albini really became aware of and, and significantly used color. Um, the floors, terracotta, the marble, the wood, and then painted metal all um, <coughs> characterized certain qualities of this house. This was 1939. One of his most notable interior experiments um, was given to him as an opportunity by designing the interior apartment in the roof of one of the museums that he works in, in the Attico space, um, for Caterina Mercenaro. Um, Caterina was an important patron, hired him to design four museums, ultimately in the city of Genoa, and commissioned him to design her apartment, um, which you see here, uh, this very um, quixotic kind of hanging cap over a um, suspended hearth piece for burning and a stone hearth that's meant to look like it's floating in the space. Um, and this apartment, um, like a number of the other pieces he's doing at this time, continue to play with ways of suspending materials in space. N no apartment, though, is more important than his own for the experiments. This, um, his family apartment in 1940 seems to use all of the elements at once and set him up for a number of the projects, especially the gallery installations that will follow. So you see the painting has left the wall. Um, the wall can no longer be used because it's now covered with a, shri a, a scrim of a veil that sh um, filters the light into the room, disguises the windows as, as framed openings. You see the glass radio that's now become a, a, a side table. The Villiero bookshelf acts as a room divider. He loves horizontal surfaces that reflect light. Joe Ponti publishes this building as well. So all of this is significant because it means Albini's work is being immediately disseminated at, at the time that he's working. It's available to many. 
And it's really this early that Albini decides that the room is the unit element of making modern architecture. He is committed to designing from the inside out. And looking at the tension of the potential relationships, all of his novel in innovations, um, are meant to work together, a kind of composed unity within um, that allows that room within a room to be full of dynamic tension and uh, set up relationships of the space, form, surfaces, and so on. And a number of ideas, I think, um, can be kind of parsed out of that. What is it about the characteristic of his rooms? What are the kinds of things that he continues to do in his work? He finds ways to divide the rooms up, um, but maintain views through the room. So while the artifact demands a lot of attention, the transparency is apparent. And the relationship of the, the figure of the shape of the floating element and the surrounding, the perimeter of the room, um, creates a strong center and edge tension. Um, the attention to that figure also um, is important because he uses such uh, lovely material craft, such care in crafting the artifact um, that these things have endured are with us today. But perhaps most important in all of these experiments is the point at which he uses the novel modern element inside uh, a historic uh, environment so that we begin to see this important juxtaposition of new and old elements that becomes an important part of his legacy and many of the other architects of that time period. So for Albini, this idea of the primal room may not readily seem so significant until one begins to think about what others are doing at this time. So during the 30s and 40s, we know very well the beautiful um, experiments and houses of Mies van der Rohe, Gropius, Le Corbusier, and so on, who are all designing modern objects. The buildings are exploded houses or point, line, and plane. They're artifices that are viewed and designed from the outside in. Yet we know another favorite modernist who eventually comes to the same conclusion, that in fact the room is the primal element of modern architecture. But it's not until the 50s, after, well after Kahn designs the Yale Art Gallery, his tour de force of geometry in the open plan, um, that he decides, in fact, after the Trenton bathhouses, um, famous for his use of served and servant spaces, that he'll no longer rely on the open plan, but use the, the defined room, the room with proportions, the room with a contained space and the geometries that go with that. Um, the original photograph uh, that I showed you by William Penn of Albini was 1948. 48 was a really important time in Albini's life. Um, he had lost many good friends during the war. Um, he was now working more exclusively on his own. And he gets a very strange commission. Um, in the city of Cervinia, uh, in the north, he produces this youth hostel for um, Pierrovino, uh, an alpinist, a, a skier. Um, and this is a youth hostel. Um, doesn't look like much else that Albini's done, but we've already, already established that not many of his buildings look alike. Um, the concept for this building is the Baeta, or the traditional mountain uh, village home, is raised up. You see the typical dwelling of wood and very steep roofs, and it's lifted up on these three-story tapered columns, or piloti, holding the accommodation space above and the other social spaces, dining and so on below. Um, now, this building got Albini in a lot of trouble with the Siam architects. Um, you're aware of the fact that the canonical modern, modernists who were very much invested in, a, in maintaining a strong, radical, abstract, international style modernism um, throughout Europe was beginning to have some doubts about the Italians. Um, this is long before BBPR's Tor Velasca building in Milan, but it certainly didn't look very modern to most of the world. Bruno Zevi, on the other hand, defended this building as a very good example of what he was looking for in organic architecture. And it's not only because of the use of materials, but because there was a true exploration in the design of the building, in the way it was crafted, how it was crafted, the qualities of the spaces. And even in this dining space, the, um, a perpetual um, example that we find throughout his work is the clear story window that creates a slice of glass horizontally and makes the most of the views, in this case, these mountain views. But also in 1949, Albini gets his first major museum um, uh, commission. 
from Caterina Mercenato. And there are a couple of ways in which it's been proposed that Mercenato learned about Albini. She very much admired the show at the Brera with the suspended artworks. She was also, uh, there was an employee in her public office that was a brother of Giovanni Romano with whom Albini commissioned. But however she came to know his work, um, they bonded immediately around a common need, which is that these dwelling museums, these, these kind of um, dusty, old, dark museums that housed very important works of art in, in Genoa simply had to be modernized, opened up, lighted in a different way. And she found in Albini um, the architect with whom she could work. Um, the Palazzo Bianco Museum is published in George Kidder Smith's book, Italy Builds. And this is uh, a point at which a, a a uh, book that circulated widely then um, brought Albini's work to uh, an international audience. Um, you see that uh, Kidder Smith opens here saying that it might be said with more than a grain of truth that Italians have the finest art and the worst museums in the world. Um, so he credits um, Albini with changing that. <coughs> The building had been bombed by the Allies, so it was virtually gone. The Palazzo building had already been reconstructed uh, before Albini was commissioned. He was invited to do one installation um, initially with Mercenato before he was commissioned to completely renovate the collection um, for the building. And essentially what Albini did was find ways to um, incorporate all of the spaces in a way in which the um, traditional spaces could still be observed, but now with his um, glass systems, uh, clothes in the loggia, and so on, and introduce the neutral white gallery really for the first time in Italy by doing so by inserting it within a Baroque palazzo. The quality of light that he was able to work with was beautiful. Of course, it had to be filtered to deal with the collection, but he and Mercenato began to think about novel ways of exhibiting these works, taking historic works out of their heavy frames, exhibit, exhibiting like you see here in clusters, working with con certain traditional qualities of the space, like the reflective glass floor, um, and in other cases, choosing abstract surfaces that worked best for the materials. And he did a number of things that were controversial, not appreciated by curators, including um, trying to create this kind of easel exhibition um, by pinning a rod in a, a medieval building fragment. They weren't very happy about that. Um, but the most controversial was this piece, which did not last, uh, the beautiful 14th century Pisano sculpture of Margarita di Brabante was positioned on a piston so that viewers in the museum could actually operate this and put it in the best light. Um, that certainly didn't last. However, um, at this time, Scarpa and Albini were teaching together in Venice. And Scarpa admired this project very much. She wrote Albini a letter, and he asked him about specifically about his lighting system. Um, he also liked the Rabante piece. And so when he introduced a museum in the Palazzo Abatellis in Palermo, he positions Eleonora di Toledo in this way, <coughs> another bust of a noble woman that became the focal point of a beautiful room. Albini now is working with Franca Helg, and Albini and Helg received the commission in 1952 to renovate another domestic palazzo across the street from the Palazzo Bianco, this one known as the Palazzo Rosso. It's a much longer project. It's a much more difficult, more complex project. They stand up to yet more local criticism for the work. It takes them um, 12 years to complete the project. Um, but many of the... Um, pieces that begin to get developed serve in this case, it's worthwhile recognizing um, that the city of Genoa had a, as important an impact at, on Albini as he had on the city itself. The city uh, has the densest intact medieval fabric in, in Europe, which means streets are so narrow you can touch buildings on both sides, very little light gets through that dense fabric, and so he had to work with the light available to um, make this building work, again, from the inside out, using the light, um, the daylight there. And this palazzo is unusual for another reason. It was commissioned by two noblemen brothers in the 17th century that had their duplexes one above the other. So you didn't have the traditional single piano nobile level. You had two. And one brother 
um, stayed in the building. The other brother um, died before he was able to complete the interior frescoing. So you have parts of the building that look like this, parts that look like this, and you have this dichotomy of wonderful quality of spaces, but very difficult to exhibit the work in those spaces that are highly frescoed. And, um, Decades of curators have criticized Mercenado and Albini for the way they handled um, the restoration of that work. Um, but this stairway then was the tour de force on Albini's part to create a new public circulation system where there was none. There was no single system to go vertically through the building and this was his solution to that problem. The stair all hangs from above, so it's just delicately sitting on the ground. It's completely suspended. Another device developed by Albini and Helg, uh, along with Mercenado for this building, was these pivots that would allow a viewer of the works of art to, again, position them in the light that was most desirable. Well, that didn't last, but again, Scarpa uh, appropriated the idea at the Abatelis by hanging the beautiful Antonello di Messina's, and in, in Palermo, these pivotal structures remain. So returning to the apartment that Albini designed for Mercenado, and you see her here in the figure on the far side, Mercenado herself had a beautiful art collection, and um, it must have been a pleasure for him to install her work in her own apartment as he designed this Attico apartment. Again, Ponti made it well known by publishing and describing this great work of art as a work of architecture. And when I began my work in Genoa, I was very disappointed to find that it had been used as a warehouse. Um, it was learning from the then curator how uh, much uh, respect had been lost for Albini, particularly in this project. Um, and I'm happy to say that after recent restoration, not only has the space been um, returned uh, to much more what it was like it, when Mercenado lived there, but also it's now part of the gallery sequence, so it's a public space that can be visited in, in the building. Um, although her original art collection is no longer exhibited there, many of the works of Albini's furniture are in, in place. I return now to the treasury of San Lorenzo. Um, this was Mercenado's third commission to Albini and Helg, and the to enter the small four circles underground, one must first enter the Duomo of the city of Genoa, this 11th century basilica. And upon entering past the nave through the sacristy, descend underground. And the original project published in UNESCO's magazine called Museums looked like this. The first plan had five cylinders. Later we'll see it has four. Um, coincidentally, in this publication, Louis Kahn's uh, Yale Art Gallery is included in the same volume. Now, Albini's source for the design of this building was the treasure of Atreus at Mycenae. And we know this because Albini took his students from Venice to see the treasury, and he sent a postcard back to Mercenaro. And in the postcard, he says, you were right. So it had been, obviously, a part of a dialogue that they'd had. Albini then, from this important 13th century BC project, comes back with the idea of the stacked stone, the local stone that creates a particularly sublime kind of horizontality to this round room, stacked uh, layers, um, dark, kind of brooding, underground. But it's the perfect environment for a crypt, full of gilded chalices and gem-studded robes, these precious ancient religious sacred artifacts that had been brought back to the city of Gen Genoa during the Crusades by Guglielmo and Briacci. And unfortunately, this slide is washed out due to the flash, but you see the promontory stone. This stone is a local Genoese stone. There is no more of it. It's matte finish, so it doesn't reflect light. It's kind of beautiful, though. You can see people's hand marks on the side of the doorway. Um, this is attributed to, the, to Saint Anne. Her bone and flesh can be seen inside this silver um, piece. And Albini never occupied the center of a circle. He built all of the interior infrastructure and uh, very sophisticated and beautiful lighting system to be able to appreciate these precious works. But he never occupies the center. So the final um, 
plan of this building is, in fact, this one. And this is the plan that was published in Architectural Forum in 1957. And I'm quite sure that this is the plan that Philip Johnson saw when he produced his painting gallery in 1965. I doubt that Johnson actually visited the treasury. And if he did, he wasn't particularly influenced by the sublime and phenomenal qualities of that space. And I don't know if anyone ever asked Philip Johnson, with 40 acres, why, why, all those beautiful follies in your landscape, why put the painting gallery underground? But nonetheless, in conversation with Philip Johnson, especially um, as he's interviewed by Vincent Scully, what would you suspect he uses as his historic reference for this project? the treasury of Atreus. At this time, Albini's studio has grown now to include Franca Helg as his partner. She remains in the studio um, through his death and continues to run um, Studio Albini for uh, 12 years until her own death. This is a fun photograph because when one sees it zoomed out, he's standing three stairs lower because he was much taller than she is photographer got them to appear more egalitarian in staging the photograph. So Franca Helg's influence can't be underestimated, but neither can it be easily assessed. Franca Helg wrote a very important piece called The Testimony to Franco Albini two years after he died, and she effectively credits him for everything that they did together. There's another important woman in Albini's career, and that is Matilda Baffa. I was directed to meet her very early in my work. Um, Matilda Baffa, as a young student in Venice, was a student of Albini's, and after a very difficult competition, he selected her to be his um, teaching assistant and research assistant at Venice. He warned her that it would be a very, very difficult position for a woman at that time in the mid-50s. And the next day, she got a call from Franca Helg saying, he means it when he says it's difficult, but I encourage you to take the job. He's wonderful to work for. And she did. And later, uh, she became full professor at the uh, Polytechnic of Milan, where she was then Albini's colleague. Um, she's been a great help to me in this work. She provided me with the book called the MSA. Um, the uh, Movimento per gli Studi di Architettura is a collection of talks by over a 16-year period from 45 to 61 put together by Baffa and three others, because at that time, the students in Milan had no place to access a modern curriculum. Milan at that time was still taught by classicists. So Venice was the only real modern school in Italy. The collection of essays and talks reflects what they were all talking about then. And Albini was one of the 11 architects that put that group together. And it was one of the more important, not necessarily one of the more vociferous or common, but he spoke very um, clearly and uh, intelligently about what he believed was the relationship between modernity and tradition at that time. So I am indebted to, to Baffa for her generosity and her assistance in this work. I'm going to uh, really fly by two projects. Um, these are two office buildings. Um, the importance is that they are both begun in 1950, it means before Helg is in the studio, and again, they illustrate my claim um, that he was not bound at all to style, but instead, Albini was greatly influenced by the contexts in which he's working. Still in Genoa, we see the building that's long been referred to as the new municipal offices. It's now called, only recently, Palazzo Albini. It's a U-shaped structure that sits behind the Baroque Palazzo Turzi, the town hall of the city of Genoa. Town council chambers are located under that egg-shaped roof. And his interest in light and views is apparent in choosing this kind of U-shaped diagram that does not sit symmetrically behind the palazzo, but is shifted. Um, he uses shading systems to control the light, but meanwhile, the light penetrates deeply into the space so that all offices have access to daylight and views of the Mediterranean. So you see here the way the building has been shifted, but you also notice something else, that it's the one building that looks like no other buildings in the context. So where for the four centuries after the Renaissance that um, Italians built up the hillside of Genoa, they built largely cubic kind of volumetric boxes, and he chooses to build a 10-story terrace that shifts back, moves back uh, to arrive at this Castelletto neighborhood above in a distinctly different diagram 
that also includes a pedestrian promenade that cuts right through the space. So one can assault the hill as a pedestrian and arrive to a completely different neighborhood from the public, the uh, central hall, the monumental courtyard of the town hall palazzo, and right up the side of the hill under the public elevator to arrive and have a beautiful view back over the slate rooftops of the city of Genoa and the Mediterranean below. It's the first example that I know of of a green roof anywhere. And he creates these um, contemplative gardens, unaccessible. At the very same time, in the city of Parma, he designs another um, insurance company headquarters. Here we see another example of the palazzo building lifted up, a facade building in a way that the um, offices in Genoa have no interest in being a facade, certainly not competing with the facade of the Baroque Palace. But this facade plays some very interesting compositional games with the use of the grid and the layers of that grid. You can read, I think, in this photograph that the columns, the um, pilasters that make up the vertical elements of the grid taper back. They get thinner as they go up, as they meet that overriding cornice. And you can understand, too, that this palazzo-type building has been lifted up. So it's, ri it's rising above on uh, pilasters. And it's easy to see, then, that the, that concrete frame is not structural. It's completely ornamental. The structure of the building is shown here, and they don't line up. So he's completely interested in an expression of a facade, a plaid lattice, that allows him to play shifty games. This um, building by Figini and Polini in Torino seems to be at least influenced by this game of shifting the, uh, of locating the concrete pilaster right through what should be a rectangular, uh, orderly um, frame of a window. So we've seen that the structural exoskeleton sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Sometimes it's a faux structure, but with the Renascente store, obviously, it's fulfilling its job of, of being a, an exterior structure, a, a complete structure for that palazzo building. And this building has, has worn fairly well. Here, when it's first built, surrounded by lots of little Cinquecento cars, and today, in a renovated state, it's, um, it, it plays a pretty significant role in that domain of the city. And again, I think w one can recognize a certain similarity to the use of the palazzo typology, the structural exoskeleton with infill panels, even to the uncanny similarity of the six glass windows creating a monumental composition of symmetry on one side. So I'll leave it for you for a moment to speculate what the potential relationship between Louis Kahn and, and Franco Albini may have been. While I go on to show just the last two museums of Albini's career, um, in the late 60s, we're already getting to a point at which Italians are no longer convinced that modern interventions into the historic fabric are viable, are desirable. Um, they, uh, and after these two buildings by Albini and the works of such as Castelvecchio and Scarpa and BBPR at the Sforza Castle in Milan, we see no more of that kind of uh, risky but bold intervention in the historic fabric. In the city of Genoa again, at the San Agostino Museum complex, we find the last commission of Caterina Mercenaro for Studio Helg, Franca and Franco. And um, just about the same time in the city of Padua, the Civic Museum complex um, asks for an uncannily similar kind of project. Because in both cases, we have basilicas and double cloistered uh, infrastructure that were bombed by the Allies, nearly destroyed, and require uh, an intervention that makes critical decisions about what part of the historic fabric should be restored, what part should be replaced, and what balance should occur between them. Here in Genoa, at the San Agostino Hill top, um, we see the um, fabric of the old church where this um, delightful little 13th century triangular courtyard is marginally damaged but is completely restored in the project. Meanwhile, the rectangular cloister next to it had been um, completely demolished. Now, this church complex is one that had been deconsecrated already for many centuries. Um, Napoleon had stashed his horses and troops there and so on. So it had not served as a, a religious site for a long time. 
Um, but one of the components of the Albini project was to continue the pedestrian promenade right through the triangular courtyard to make a, a break through what you saw was a very long urban block. Um, that networking the city shows how much time and attention Albini paid to the city of narrow passageways and um, allowed for that kind of system. The, we've seen projects in which Albini was very much focused on a facade architecture. And in this case, we find that his expression of a facade is much simpler, much more subtle, um, less powerfully expressive, or at least in competition or uh, in evidence with the surrounding um, area, but certainly um, a sophisticated development of, this, of the infrastructure of the exoskeletal steel structure and infill panels. So on the Piazza Sarsana, we see the facade of the, the building marrying, continuing the um, facade of, of the others, and a really understated entryway into the museum. With, again, a look at what the city of Genoa offers up as pedestrian passageways. These stepped ramps are characteristic of this very hilly city, and he appropriates that directly, brings a stepped ramp into the building as a, a way of sliding up through the museum. And the collection in this museum is largely remnants of um, medieval architecture, so a lot of it is stone and can take bright sunlight, um, so that a uh, loggia space, that exterior cloister, is the source of views and light. And in looking at the interior infrastructure, again, um, like architects of his period, Albini very much designed every detail. When I showed these sketches to a collaborator, Vittorio Prina, um, he said that those were actually ideas of Franca Helg's. She designed that particular detail. Um, but one of the things that became apparent to me in this project is it's a unique opportunity to see what Albini does in section when dealing with such a complicated site. He really had three distinctly ide different ideas about modern glass, three different ideas about transparency, and he used all three of them stacked in section here. On the top level, at, around that central cloister space, he extends the six-foot deep steel beam so that he needs no corner column. He takes the corner column away altogether. And we know from studies of the Renaissance the problem that the corner co column perpetually created. Here he just removes it. Meanwhile, at the main level of the galleries, we find this relatively traditional cloister center. Um, but he rebuilt that. That was not a histor an actual historic uh, cloister. He rebuilt it, columns with emphasis, arches, capitals, and so on, and, and was significantly criticized for that act. But what I see when I look at that is a different kind of solution to a problem. In He's housing this faux artifact in a glass box. He's got edges to that box. He details the glass box, just like he does with all of the other glass boxes for his installations of artifacts. So now he's using the glass to hold another object. And finally, at the lowest level of the building, we see a submerged glass box, a kind of inside-out glass house that brings light deep into the space. And so each of the three of these components use the, the medium to do different things for the building. And with a very similar to problem to solve, about the same time in the city of Padua, we find a complex that had also <laughs> lost completely one of its cloisters from the church. And this time it's the minor cloister. And this time, instead of rebuilding the space, he allows it to be very simple, using, a, again, his steel structure, in a pattern in which the paired columns create ornament and um, make the, um, give this kind of um, articulation of very clearly modern elements against the brick wall of the old cathedral. And in using the centered columns, again, he removes the corner. So you get a very different expression of weight, of gravity, something very heavy and very dark, a long way from the lyrical, light modernity of his early rationalist days. There's another portion of this project that was not completed. Much of Albini's work here was not finished um, by him. But this Pinacoteca project was completely detailed. All the drawings were done. It was ready to go. And they begin to get cold feet about including modern interventions with historic fabric. So this five-bay 
gallery is never completed. And yet, we see uh, long, narrow spaces, beautifully proportioned in section, with daylight entered in along the spine, light that bounces off the um, reflecting panel that also holds the artificial light systems, and no surprise, we can find a great similarity once again to the work of Lucan. So here we are, what have you decided? What is their relationship? It's been a conundrum for me throughout this work because I think it's not so difficult to understand how Johnson was influenced by Albini or how Lina Bobardi or even Carlos Scarpa in, engaged in a dialogue, they worked together, they shared a lot. But between Kahn's new monumentality and Albini's magical abstraction, we find similar responses to a post-ideological modernism. Both architects are very active during a period of late modernism with clearly criticisms of the problems of the ubiquity of the one-size-fits-all international style has not missed them. Land speculation, mass marketing, mass consumption, all of these things were changing completely the environments in which they worked. And both of them taught while they practiced. They were involved in the discussions of their time. They showed a great deal of reverence for human culture and not an easy or nostalgic idea of tradition, but a tradition that was very carefully defined and critically, accept, critically assessed, but above all was constantly changing. They introduced a new re reverence for the site, the context, the city, the human experience, and the integrity of materials always with innovation, where tradition and modernity were no longer perceived in opposition. Both architects, albeit from different cultures, came to the same conclusion of a situated modernism. I also looked for all the potential times they were in the same room together. Kahn, of course, had a Prix de Rome. Um, Albini's works at Siam were published specifically after the Bridgewater meetings in 56. Kahn presented the Richards Medical Center at Siam in 1959, and Albini was there. Um, Albini spoke at Princeton in the early 60s. We know he spoke English. And, of course, under Samana's leadership at the UAV in Venice, all of the great modern architects passed through. But the only time I could find convincingly that they were actually together was in Massachusetts in 1964, when Bobby and Jackie Kennedy invited nine internationally renowned architects to consult on the development of the, con, of the Kennedy Library, the, the competition or the uh, commission that later went to I.M. Pei. So here, over Bobby Kennedy's shoulder, we see a smiling Franco Albini. Um, and on the other corner of the image, we see a surreptitious Lou Kahn peeking out of squinty eyes. And there, right in the middle, is a big old happy Mies van der Rohe. <laughs> That's Jackie O. That's Jackie O, yep. And I'm going to conclude now with just a brief final story. In the uh, years of working on Albini, we hosted an exhibition of his work, and with that, we held a symposium, and we asked the question about uh, his relationship between modernity and tradition and that of other scholars from comparative studies and literature and fine arts, and Marco Albini joined us at that meeting. Um, Marco Albini was very interested in this. What my students chose to do was to build a mock-up of that beautiful Villiero bookshelf. We looked all over Milan, couldn't find it, asked Marco. Marco said, yeah, it's broken, it's in my mom's closet, don't know how to put it back together again. There was only one. She said, okay, we'll give it a try. So we refabricated our own mock-up of the Villiero bookshelf. He was convinced, although we missed the scale by about nine-tenths. It's okay, still supports books. And he went back to the Casina company. And he said, hey, Casina, don't you think you can make one? Those kids at Ohio State can do it. Can't you do it? Sure. So for the wonderful zero gravity retrospective that Renzo Piano installed in the Trinale in Milan in 2006, Casina refabricated Vellero. But of course, they're not going to do it just once. Now, you can have one too. <laughs> OK? For only 23,000 euro, Veliero can be yours. And I'm telling you, I'm not selling mine on eBay. <laughs> Thank you for your attention today. I'd be happy to address questions.
Thank you for a comprehensive presentation of, a, of an architect I'm sure that most of us really don't know or maybe thought we knew but now know far better. Thank you. Um, very interesting work and interestingly presented. I'm sure there might be some questions or comments about the work or their talk, please. Daniel Shearer. Professor Shearer. Wait a minute, wait for the mic. We don't want to lose a oh, moment no, of I'm your. I'm sure my voice is so. It's for the recording. Soft. It's a recording. Yes. Uh, uh, Philip Johnson, it seems, returned again to Albini in the pre Columbian Museum in Dumbarton Oaks, which was a pod like uh, constant, which was mm -hmm. extruded upwards. Mm -hmm. It was as if the treasury of Atreus and. Uh, that uh, uh, earlier iteration. Yet none of the subtlety of the geometrically none. related circles, right? Those are all the same dimension circles in a right. surrounding, right? And you mentioned Lena Bobardi and uh, mm -hmm. the MOSP and how uh, the radical gesture, which she thought was democratic, of taking the paintings away from the aristocratic surfaces of the mm -hmm. palazzo mm -hmm. or museum mm -hmm. and then putting them on those support systems. Mm -hmm. That's very much Albini mm -hmm. inspiration. Mm -hmm. They both work for Joe Ponti, right? Correct. And then mm -hmm. Massimo Scolari uh, told me, the Davenport professor mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. that Daniel, I read your piece on Albini and therefore you know who I really am. Mm -hmm. I am tradition and modernity together, but I refuse to build, he says. I see. So Scolari, does he credit Albini in he his does. own upbringing? Yes. Uh -huh. He says okay. that Albini was the most important figure for him uh -huh. in 1966 before he met uh, Rogers. Actually, it was a 64 that he took Albini. Of course, mm -hmm. 66 Rogers and then Rossi. Mm -hmm. So Scolari really sees himself as a child of Albini. Has he written about that? No. He so you it. need to write that. I one. did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Daniel. Excuse me. Questions, not. <laughs> questions end with a I'm rise of the voice. I No, I had not. Okay, Thank we you. can discuss this over a drink. <laughs> Nancy. KB, I am not an architecture sophisticate, so this may not be an interesting question at all, but. You made two statements that I wonder if, if they're correlated. One is the room as his basic unit of architecture, mm -hmm. and the other, no set style. And so I'm wondering if you start with a room as the unit, mm -hmm. does that mean that that leaves all the other options open for, for the larger, for the building, for the object? Um, Okay, so your question is, if you're starting from the room, by mm -hmm. definition, are you going to always not get to the same point? Thank you, yes. Um, possibly, but the, I think you know, most architects care deeply and think greatly about what their buildings look like on the outside. And inevitably, as they're developing ideas, there's a certain repetition or recurrence or desire to develop an idea, and we saw that also with Albini. There were some buildings that absolutely were facade buildings, and so he was working with, excuse me, with systems on the outside, clearly. But I think that what's great about all of the buildings that I've experienced is that the rooms are compelling. They're compelling for daylight. They're compelling for the integrity of the materials, for the proportions of the rooms, the sequencing of the rooms. And because of the nature of this kind of modern architecture, there's a continuity between inside and outside. So when you saw that facade of the San Agostino Museum and these big steel frames around windows and some big windows, those windows are at the end of the spaces around the loggias, where the narrow windows are not. So there's a correlation between what you end up reading on the exterior and what's happening inside the building. And my argument would be that he's driven by the body of ideas that grow from the inside out. So that facade is a result of that pattern of interior spatial arrangement. Does that make sense? If he's starting with the room, does that lead to a greater variety of facades as the end result? I guess the reason that's hard to say absolutely is because Every project has a different scale of room, if it's domestic, if it's museum or gallery scale. Um, and what I would argue is sophisticated and important about Albini is the care he takes to satisfy the client's program. So in other words, for him, he said, no ugly works of art, they just need to be exhibited properly. Um, 
you know, he's very dedicated to the solving of the problem before his problem, which is to express himself. And so those are some of the kinds of things that I think inherently lead to an architecture of greater integrity, of greater ingenuity, of greater beauty. And one component of that is that he's designing so many rooms early in his career that by the time he gets to these larger urban projects or more monumental scale endeavors, he, has, he can't help himself but to work at the scale of the gallery or the room or the space or the courtyard and then ultimately resolve the problem on the exterior. Thank you. Yes. Questions? Some more questions, please? Yes. Ma'am. You commented earlier that, like, uh, the lack of translation into other languages besides Italian and uh, sort of lack of primary materials as reasons why more people don't know a lot about Albini, but what did you find was the primary reason why he doesn't have a higher profile? Um, so he built a lot of work, and I showed you the greatest hits, in my opinion. Um, there are some buildings that maybe arguably are not uh, this quality. Um, he built some large-scale office buildings. He built some chunks of cities that are beyond scale. And there are those um, collaborators of Albini in the past or others who have said, yeah, that wasn't really Albini. That was those other guys he worked with. Because there is a, a high degree of respect for Albini himself. He was a very taciturn guy. In the 50s, when Sert became the dean of architecture at Harvard, that position was first offered to Rogers, who turned it down. But my thinking is that if Rogers had taken the job at that time, he would have brought all of his Italian buddies and that Albini would have had much more exposure in the US. Albini built in um, Sao Paulo, uh, brought by the uh, Bobardis. He built in Stockholm. He, uh, but again, so much of his important work were these ephemeral installations. They're photographed, but they're, they've gone away. Um, but beyond that, I guess I would ask you, having seen the work, is it surprising to you that they aren't better known, or does it seem sort of run of the mill or ordinary or too few to be important or too insignificant because they're too different from one another? Maybe it's just harder to make a larger journalistic mm -hmm. sort of byline or like title for his work in the way that it is for, you know, Khan with, you know, modern monumentalism or something like that. Mm -hmm. Albini didn't work very hard to sell himself. Way back, there's a... Thank you. Uh, you talked about post-ideological modernism. Yes. Um, could you say any more about his uh, tendency towards a machine aesthetic that was actually made by hand? Um, yes, yeah, so um, the furniture makers with whom Albini worked love to talk about him. Um, there's a guy named Poggi and another named Bonacina the early furniture that he did, some of this stuff out of rattan and so on, they um, speak about Albini as a great designer and architect because he worked closely with them. He was very interested in the craft and the detail. And consequently, um, sometime later, the furniture designer Vico Magistretti said about Albini, he was born too soon, by which he meant Albini didn't make it in mass production like all the rest of the guys did. He was really invested in making the perfect object, but didn't particularly care if it was mass produced or not. Um, the artifact that you see that is this column that keeps recurring, it's different every time, depending upon the need and the installation, sometimes out of steel, most often out of wood. But he keeps going back to that problem and refining it in very fine detail. It's time consuming. Um, so I think in that sense, his interest in fabrication shows in the work immediately and on site, it doesn't necessarily publish that well. It doesn't translate that well. It doesn't export that well. But it's the kind of architect he was. It was what he was dedicated to in his practice. Early on, in, during this important period of rationalism, we know about those guys that wrote the treatises and talked about um, typologies and talked about um, the new spirit of the time. And um, that became a kind of manifesto that was shared by other young rationalist architects in Italy. Um, Albini was part of that, but he, there are copies of his versions of the Futurist Manifesto and um, Boccioni's book on Futurist Architecture with lots of margin notes of him saying things like balderdash. This is kind of crazy. You know, not, who needs this stuff? Because he was not inherently inclined to speak theoretically 
or to create a theoretical argument or to sell an argument. He made stuff. And he made stuff consistently and well long enough that ultimately I think we can look at it and see these important continuities or things that he achieved, but not because he set out to write a manifesto. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Not so much. Wait one second, Susie. From what, what we've observed of Albini, um, and you talked about tension, he worked best, I don't think it's because he didn't have good marketing people. His whole idea was about um, a secondary move. And uh, given the context of what we, he had, whether it was a room or, or like uh, uh, the Bianco, uh, Palazzo Bianco, of, uh -huh. Palazzo uh -huh. Bianco uh, he was kind of like a spider, can I say that? Where you make a web, huh. and you can't make that web unless there's something somewhere. Okay, so he's responsive. So it's a secondary move, and uh, he's, he's not a fundamental macho kind of guy like Louis Kahn, you know, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm the structure, I'm the building. Yeah. yeah. But what would you but say he about also, the, the whole idea of, uh, in fact, his buildings, the, the building itself is quite, uh, uh, what is it, fluid. But he was like a, he, he was very good when he could insert as a secondary, secondary move, what can I say? Yeah. Um, yeah, you didn't show sponsor. something because probably you didn't want to get bombed at for being politically incorrect. But, you know, he, he did weird things. But the designs he did were, um, but if you really think about it, I used to think he was like an Italian macho, you know, that, you know, he used to take pictures of himself in, with like pilot, you know, he would, he would, for, yeah, I mean, he was almost porno. Susie, you're not and finishing No, no, he also, <laughs> no, this is very important. He designed brassiers and, and, and uh, 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 what is it, girls no, no, for women. No, no, it's not, uh, not Albini. You're thinking of Carlo, Carlo Molino. Molino. Oh, I'm getting Italians mixed up. But, well, he was I, the brassiere man. What I was going to say, Never mind. It, it's about defying gravity. And so it's... Do I have to give my lecture again? Okay, I think we're going to... Quit on that, except that I would like to make one slight observation. That I, and first of all, I think that was Paul Rudolph's face in that Kennedy picture, just half in and half out. Oh, really? He was Paul one Rudolph of the architects there? considered for the library. Was he? Yes, indeed. Huh? Um, and he made the final cut of four. Did he? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think Rudolph, in his early work, like the exhibition, you see that? Ed, the ear, the ear? <laughs> this one right here? You have to look and see if he was at that meeting. This guy, this is Paul Rudolph. It's the crew cut. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I just wanted to make one sort of artist, art, art historical observation. I think Rudolph was very influenced by Albini in his early career oh, okay. in the installations like the Family of Man yes. and the, the good design installations, the MoMA and the... Uh, the place in Chicago that the, the Kennedys actually owned, the design center. So I think Albini was perceived as a kind of interior and exhibition architect. Yes. And the, the Rinascente was well received, but it was a surprise. Interesting. I, that's my, I'm just a little bit older, and so that's yeah. the way I saw it. But I, I think it's uh, time to thank you for an incredibly good talk. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.